Well, CEI, welcome. Uh, it is, it's great to have you. It's uh, Friday, uh, February 19th, and uh, uh, a little overcast uh, and cold, but uh, again, it's, it's really wonderful to be able to spend a little bit of time with you. And we have a wonderful guest today. I am so excited to have Amy Lentz. She, she has been uh, just a great supporter of the college, uh, just significant in a variety of things that she does, both for INL and uh, for the community in general. So Amy, welcome. Thank you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your podcast. It's such an honor to be asked to be here. <laughs> well, thank you too. That, yeah, that's, that's very nice. Well, uh, as you know, COVID has changed a lot of things and, and maybe we can delve into some of those topics uh, as to how, uh, you know, what you're doing at the lab uh, with COVID. But, you know, a great way to start would be to just give you the floor and have you talk a little bit about your background and, and, and give our viewers a little bit of context. Absolutely. So um, I call myself an Idaho girl, but a rural Idaho girl. So I grew up in north central Idaho in a little tiny town, Orofino. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of passion about our little rural towns of Idaho. Um, my background is actually environmental science and I have a bachelor's or that's my bachelor's degree. And my, my master's is from University of Idaho in industrial engineering technology. So yeah, Idaho just runs through my blood. Um, most of my career has been spent in site assessments, you know, environmental assessments for siting. And then I moved into site selection for industry. And then I specialized a lot in energy siting and worked for a lot of engineering firms and in doing that work and took on projects that were bigger and bigger. And eventually found myself um, at the Idaho National Laboratory back in Idaho. I started here and left and came back and it was a really exciting time. I've been a little bit of a chameleon, but I've always kept my roots in strategy and program management and project management and with a thread of great science and engineering that, that ekes out in all of those areas. And currently um, I uh, lead our supply chain strategies for Idaho National Laboratory. And that means our workforce pipeline, our talent pipeline strategy, specific to a lot of our growing engineering and, and energy sectors, as well as our suppliers and, and bringing more breadth and depth and capability to the suppliers that we need to help build our future. You know, We'll, we'll delve in just a minute into the supply chain and those kind of things because that may be a term that not everybody's familiar with. But but let's additionally set the context of the mega projects for INL, and you could tick off a few of those. Uh, you and I are in so many uh, similar meetings about these, but uh, let's give our viewers a little bit of idea of what those mega uh, projects are going to be. Yeah, for, for a while we were so focused on Idaho National Laboratory and what, what projects are ahead of us. And we, we saw a lot of great opportunities coming at us and we had amazing growth as you, um, as you are well aware, as you just drive down at the MK Simpson Boulevard in our Idaho Falls campus. But we also um, were looking out into the future and saw other opportunities coming at us. So we have uh, micro reactors that we're looking at that we hope that get, get deployed at Idaho and with um, on our INL site. But we also have a test reactor that we talk a lot about in the public, which is the versatile test reactor. It's hard to have advanced reactor types without having a test reactor. You know, we've had our advanced test reactor out at the site for a long time, but we also need a new one to help support the advanced um, reactor demonstrations and, and other, other advanced technologies that are out there. So those are two major projects that we watch out for, but we also support all the infrastructure that helps the nuclear energy research community. So right now we're in the middle of building the sample um, prep lab out at the materials fuels complex, which is such an important laboratory that helps us understand um, the complexities associated with with our nuclear industry. 
Um, so, and that we also have additional infrastructure. But again, we were looking just at ourselves in some ways, and we opened up our eyes and went, there's a lot of other things going on on the INL site. So the INL site um, is the home of INL, which I work for, Patel Energy Alliance, but it's also the home of the Naval Reactors mm -hmm. Facility. And they're right in the middle of building, you know, two, almost $2 billion projects to handle their spent nuclear fuel activities that go on. So those are those are big, big efforts going on. And then you add what DOE has um, awarded to uh, New Scale and the UAMPS team, the small modular reactors, which are down the pipeline, which are 10, you know, approximately 10 smaller reactor types um, north, or I would say they're, they're west of Idaho Falls, closer to ARCO, in which they're looking at siting those, those reactors. And then, of course, you have the Idaho Cleanup Project, which is still working on major projects as well. So you start stacking all of those big projects together, and you start to get uh, a bigger picture of, oh my, we have a lot of uh, workforce needs, we have a lot of supplier needs. And that's a lot of our conversations, as you're well aware, Rick. It is um, just amazing. And, and again, for uh, maybe some of our viewers, who aren't familiar with a micro versus the small modular reactor, just kind of in layman's um, perspective, what are the sizes we're dealing with and, and what would a micro be used for versus uh, a small modular reactor? Yeah, that's always a good question to ground our audience and what, um, what right. we're talking about there. Um, so if you think about the reactors that exist today at, um, that are fueling our energy needs, those are like 1500 megawatt reactors. They're quite large. Um, that, that's what your typical megawatt size is out uh, across the country. But then um, we're talking about an, a smaller size reactor, the new scale reactor, for example, that I mentioned it's more around the 50 megawatts. So it's a smaller compact size. So often they build them in clusters. They might only want three of them or they might want six or they might want 12. But those are, those are um, thought to take care of locations that might not have such a big energy demand and that might take up a smaller footprint. Um, and so those have a lot of appeal in, in um, in, in where we're going with technology today. But then there's the micro reactors and those are like five megawatt sizes. They're, they're less than 10 megawatts. In some of the designs, they can fit in the back of a semi truck. And so um, they're, they're much smaller. The Department of Defense is very interested in these types of reactors because when um, you think about a military base, right? Right now they, they truck diesel fuel to get out to the military base. And that's very dangerous. They lose a lot of lives just in hauling um, fuel to help with their military operations. So if you had a, a micro reactor at a military operation, that would hopefully prevent a lot of transport of other, other materials and help take care of that little camp out, out in the middle of nowhere for military operations, but there's a lot of brainstorming that's happening on what those other, what micro reactors can be used for island communities or really remote communities. We hope all of that really does happen, so. So a whole new way of thinking of these, and I'll, I'll just bring it up now because this was fascinating. And about a year ago, you were uh, good enough to, to uh, provide a number of uh, Idaho Falls individuals a, a, a tour of Plant Vogel in Georgia. And that may well be the last massive uh, nuclear plant that this country would see, likely because it's taken years to build. They're significant. They have the cooling towers. It was so interesting both for me to see what's going in building this, but more importantly, what happened to the area around uh, Georgia? So reflect for a moment on what 
we're, we saw out there and, and what we may or may not want to see here. In <laughs> it's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Plant Vogel uh, is in Georgia and it is one of those large um, nuclear reactors, um, you know, more on that 1500 megawatt size. And it's so exciting um, to see finally another build happen in the United States. But it was really important. I, I, I really wanted the community and the education leaders to see it for themselves, what, what occurs, not just on the construction site, but like you said, in the entire community. So it, uh, the, the delegation um, that went there included yourself and several of your team, but it included our mayor, it included others from other education, it included um, our folks from Idaho Falls Power, it mm -hmm. also had uh, folks from economic development and the state, the commerce folks came along yep. with workforce development, which was a great team. Um, but to actually, talk to the community leaders and we're still in touch with them they are they've been an open book for us but as you recall sitting down and talking to the county officials and going if you were to do it all over again what would you do yeah. and yeah. and you know their advice was spot on plan 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 and communicate and and so often um we always don't like we 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 don't necessarily plan like we should because it's maybe not a for sure thing that's happening. And then all of a sudden it happens and it's it's right in front of us. And so it was fascinating to drive through the communities and see their housing challenges. I mean, people had trailers in their front yards that were housing construction workers. Their RV parks were full. Um, it, it the other challenge was the traffic. And I, maybe you got caught up in this too, as we were leaving from one meeting to the other, but we were right there during rush hour, I guess it was rush hour. It didn't feel like we were uh, close, you know, it was about five o'clock and the roads were packed. And so just understanding all of these challenges of making sure you have housing, taking care of making sure you understand your transportation challenges, but then the workforce discussions were really fascinating that, that we both attended and really understanding how much collaboration it takes to really make sure you plan for the workforce that you need. So Amy, in, in your role then, and, and you use the term talent pipeline, which I really like, and uh, that reaches down into K-12, and we'll get to that in a second, but, but more importantly, you've got a double-edged um, challenge, I won't say problem, and that's a graying workforce. So, would you first of all ad address uh, the graying workforce at INL, and then second, with the expansion of these projects, you're going to need to hire new employees, and and, and they're going to need a skill set. And I know at that two-year technical level, that's a a, a, a very important element for where we could fit in and partnering with the lab. So again, the great workforce, and then how do you train the number of new employees that are going to be needed? Yes, thank you. Well, I'll speak specifically to what we're seeing as our demographic at Idaho National Laboratory, and it's probably not unlike the other contractors in some mm -hmm. ways and maybe even other employers in the region. I certainly know our demographic looks a lot like the um, other commercial nuclear industries that are in the United States. I call it kind of a camel's hump a little bit. Right. So the cool news is with all the growth that we've been having, we have been hiring a lot of um, younger people, right? Um, people that are uh, great students out of college, or young in their professional careers. So we have a good, good group of um, younger folks that work for us at Idaho National Laboratory. But then we have this um, middle layer that we don't have as many, that more that you would find in your supervisor roles or your management, um, management roles. And then there's the folks that are the 50 and older that, and I raise my hand in this one, yeah. um, <laughs> that, um, that we, you know, we're on the older side of the workforce, and it's 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 something to really think about: is 
how do we gear up that middle layer to start taking these larger, more, you know, jobs of more responsibility and um, bigger projects, et cetera. So spending a lot of good time in developing our own workforce is so critical and so important. And then also bringing along um, the younger professionals to start filling, you know, the, 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 the middle um, sector of, of, those, um, of those positions. So that's what we look at when we think about the graying workforce and that knowledge transfer is so right. important. It's having our employees give back their, their knowledge to those that, um, that are coming behind us and making sure that they understand the lay of the land. Um, but then that, that also feeds into what do our other, you know, service industries, the other contractors that we have, do they also have a grain workforce? Well, yes. In some of our conversations that we've been having with the trades, for example, in the construction industry, and hopefully we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, they, they're, um, very concerned about making sure that there are more people coming into um, the construction industry uh, because they also have a grain workforce challenge ahead of them as well. So, you know, you've been really helpful in uh, helping us think about a regional skills uh, labor center, and, and that isn't future tech. And just to remind uh, any of our audience that that future tech is is looking at um, maybe a, a higher skilled or different level of skill, technical skills, things like uh, cybersecurity and um, NQA1 training and that type of thing. But, but immediately, I mean, we should be doing this right now is helping to train the workforce uh, in construction and uh, uh, whether it's plumbing or, uh, or framing, um, electrical, all of those elements, HVAC, there's not a good way to, there, there, there's not a good source of training right now in our region. Uh, probably the best is the trade union. Yes. So maybe talk about the trade unions, their problem, but then we have all of these independent construction companies that have got to have uh, a, a skilled workforce and, and we, we can help in both realms as a colleague. Yeah, definitely. So it, the partnership that you and I and others have had with the Idaho Workforce Development Council has been so important. Um, lots of big shout outs to that team there because they really are trying to keep a pulse of what the regional construction um, industry looks like and where we're going. I'll speak this specifically to INL because we've done our numbers. Um, yeah. and, and, and granted, there's some things that may or may not happen, but we also look at what's a continuous need in construction. And, and that construction need is there because we also have aging facilities, right? And there, mm -hmm. we also need to keep and maintain those facilities. So um, as we look at the horizon at INL, um, we will need about 1,100 new construction workers by 2025. That's just INL, right? And so fortunately with the Workforce Development Council, they've, they've also pulled information from the Naval Reactors Facility, the Idaho Cleanup Project, that, and hopefully we'll get more information from the new scale, small modular reactors. And they're also looking at the number of construction, you know, folks that are needed for the region. And I was looking at the numbers associated with that. And it looks as, you know, if you look at our region, um, we're looking at about a 28% increase of construction needs by 2028. That's huge. That's, that's, a, that's a lot of construction workers when you think about that. And, and that number equates to about 2,500, you know, additional in the private sector types of construction workers. So we've also, you know, peeled away the onion and talked a lot about, well, what are those highest priority, most difficult jobs that we need to, to fill? And these are these great conversation we're also having with the trades that exist in the area. And um, really it comes down to, you know, iron workers, electricians, 
you know, iron workers also include the welders, which are really a, a challenge right now to fill. Um, the construction carpenters, um, and also uh, we have the pipe fitters, as you mentioned, and the general laborers in general. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, construction workers are what we call travelers. If they they have um, they're used to going from job to job. Those plant vogel people um, that are so skilled in building a nuclear reactor, we hope to see them over here in Idaho because um, they eventually will end up, you know, some of them will end up doing projects here, but they'll also then go run off to Illinois or somebody somewhere else. But we have to have a base of construction workers. And we, we do have long-term needs as well like i mentioned these longer term maintenance positions that we have those are things that we keep our eyes on a lot but we also need to always be able to find those resources to help with these bigger projects so working in partnership is so important if we're going to look at additional facilities like you mentioned or instructors or the equipment we need to make sure we get the people trained that we need you know, it's quite the rubrics cube, and, and I'm really glad you brought up, because uh, just in this element of construction, there are permanent construction jobs, and then there are temporary construction jobs, and uh, there's a myriad of both. I'm, I've not heard the 28% the before. I knew, I've just heard absolute numbers, but when we look at um, almost a third increase in construction, that is uh, a significant number. Uh, so, so part of this is trying to entice uh, our uh, existing um, young workforce to move into a family wage uh, type of a job. What, what, are, what are some, I know that the lab is doing a variety of those kinds of things, and we're we're attempting to do that as well. But what do you, what do you think we ought to be doing to? This isn't San Diego, right? So <laughs> it's not. Uh, you're here. You're accustomed to it. You may not want to live in San Diego, but it's hard moving from Florida here. You may not yes. know what we're in for. So, how are you thinking about that? We're we're retaining uh, our existing. Uh, um, um, I, I don't know if I'd call it workforce or not, but existing population to. To, yeah. to skill into these great jobs. Yeah, no, we're, we're very fortunate at Battelle Energy Alliance where this is such an important fundamental core value of, of the work and investments that we make. And um, Jennifer Jackson runs our STEM program, our K through 12 STEM program, that's science, te uh, technology, engineering, and math. Right. But we're also very much focused that, um, there's, there's a lot that falls under STEM, right? If you think about the jobs that of today, but also of tomorrow, construction, for instance, involves a lot of technology as well. It, there is so much integration that happens with today's um, uh, you know, technologies that exist. So we do focus quite a bit in trying to bring awareness to the students, the parents, the teachers, the counselors, to make sure that they understand the full opportunity of the jobs that exist. So I think one of the very first things is just get kids excited about their future because it, it's just wide open and, and it can mean so many different things for so many people. So if that kid loves to be on their, their computer all day long, there's a, there's a future for him or her. If, right. that, if they like to build things, they could be our future engineer or they could be a construction um, manager or they could be building incredible things like our future nuclear reactors. So they just need to understand that how exciting it is in terms of there's a place for all of them and it's so important for them to see themselves in what those opportunities are. So spending time you know with the right people to do that is really important and then engaging the businesses it is critical that industry cares about this and instead of always just looking at our immediate needs of the hiring that we have 
we want to make sure it's sustainable into the future and that there is a good pipeline of, of workers out there. And industries can do so much by simply just talking to a class about what they do or offering up a field trip or they're sitting around the table with the teachers and talking about you know what's important in terms of the skills that they see that they need but industry also can offer apprenticeships and it's so so important in the construction industry that not only do they um, that that the students get excited about taking a job in construction but there's a partnership there with industry so they can do some apprenticeship work and get check those boxes that they need to to be able to to work there and sometimes that gets missed and that's 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 an important important step that we have those relationships with industry you know you uh in particular have been uh really uh an advocate for young women and and kind of reminding them uh, you know it, in this k-12 early early in their career uh, uh, having a vision for what they could be and uh, uh, you, you've been uh, wonderful in that and quite the advocate and, and there's a couple of programs that you've been uh, deeply involved with touch on those uh, for a second then amy yeah, thank you. So I'm on the College of Engineering for University of Idaho, their advisory board. And um, that is definitely in my passion area. I, I help them a lot in terms of uh, thinking about how to not only get women to enter into the engineering world, but also to stay um, and it, as a student in the engineering program we lose a lot of our females the very first year. And I, I thought this was an interesting uh, scenario that plays out not only here in Idaho, but in other places. And I can relate to this completely. So you might have been a straight A student in high school, and then you end up in, your, you know, in, in engineering classes and you take your, your first you know, differential equations course and you, you get a C. <laughs> that is devastating to girls. It's just, it's sure. like, you feel like you failed. You're, you know, oh my gosh, I got to choose a different career path. And right. so, but, it, but a lot of times the guys will go, eh, all right, a C, you know, it's, that's okay. It's not going to, it's not going <laughs> to hurt me any. I'll just keep on trucking. So we, th there's a different, different right. wiring that happens. And, and we have to surround ourselves with that mentorship and also the experiences of others so so we can be good mentors for our younger our younger um, generation and so that's one thing that I completely have passion around and and it, I can see where we can do more also in encouraging women um, to enter into all of these different fields that we talked about today two-year programs or into um, in, into our skilled construction, you know, services. And, and there's, um, there's room for a lot of that to happen. We, we have a ways to go. And I think we just roll up our sleeves and start working it hard. You know, and, and you would certainly agree with this. There isn't a huge minority community in uh, uh, Eastern Idaho with the exception of, of Hispanic, but on the other hand, um, uh, students, um, living on the margin let's just say that that uh, maybe they don't have a mom and dad uh, all of those 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 students who have who come from a, a traditional middle class kind of upbringing will figure the stuff out but there are a number of students who don't have it and i've just been really impressed with the work that you do and that uh, the lab does uh, again early in life this has got to happen early in life because you're not trying to undo uh, uh, a, a self-perception that isn't true, but um, Jennifer Jackson has been wonderful in being out in uh, the K-12 system. So, so maybe reflect on that. What, what what are some things that the that Battelle is doing to encourage uh, those students living on a margin? Let's just say that. Yeah, and I, as I mentioned early when we uh, were doing introductions, um, <coughs> I'm a rural Idaho girl, and and I think that is where we've seen some of our biggest challenges in, in, in these small, small little communities of Idaho. And you'll see those folks living on the margins 
everywhere in those towns. And, and it's been a little bit sad if, um, because industry has left our rural communities as well. And, and industries always have brought good mentorship, you know, other, you know, funding to help with the schools, et cetera. Well, when they leave, then, then you are left with sometimes students and parents and teachers for that matter that don't really fully maybe understand what all those opportunities are that they can um, enjoy in life. And focusing our time and energies in the rural communities is so important. And it is hard. I mean, it is hard because you have to take the time and drive out to you know, to, to some of our little towns and get to know um, that community a little bit better. But it, it really is a value. And you'll often find some of the hardest workers in our small towns. I mean, they're used to working on the farms, they're used to ranching, they're, they're used to taking on a lot of things, but they're also are often limited in what their exposure is of what those opportunities are. So that is often where we spend some of our time and energy is trying to expose those that those communities to the great opportunities that exist. You, you know, actually, that that just reminds me of uh, an interesting concept. So, uh, in at, at Premier Technology, Doug Sayer, uh, you know, we we had dinner with him one evening and 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 talked about this, and he is so much in favor of going to these small communities where there's a good work uh, ethic uh, and being able to keep these students here, keep keep these individuals here in the region is so valuable. And yeah. I, I think you, you bring up a really important point of, of, about trying to engage those students from rural Idaho. I certainly think the um, broadband expansions are really going to be are, are so helpful to you know you mentioned um you mentioned uh you know several of our populations where you know they are ranching and they're farming but how would they possibly even think about going to school well being exposed to opportunities at least starting online is allowing them to balance you know what they're doing at home and all of their all of their chores and all of their responsibilities but also allowing them to further their education. Um, and I also really believe that the expansion of broadband is also going to help industry and, and people and individuals who can now work remotely go back to our remote communities and be the mentors and be contributors to the schools. And, you know, it take their time to also be a part of that community. So I'm very optimistic and hopeful that um, that all of, of what we've experienced in really getting broadband and getting Idaho more connected is going to really help in so many different ways in, in improving people's lives. You know, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And from a recruiting perspective, and again, you're you're not particularly in recruiting, but you you try to help with that to bring in some of the best minds in the world um, uh, to work on some of the most interesting projects in the world, you've got to have a good fiber background, a backbone. And, and we know this is happening in Ammon and it's happening in Idaho Falls. And it's and, and Brent Stacy, as you know, was my guest last week and talked about how to push that into the rural areas. But, to be a world-class scientist and uh, perhaps be uh, in the Salmon River, <laughs> Salmon, Idaho, and be able to do the bulk of your work um, virtually is a wonderful draw for the right kind of individuals. Yes, definitely, and you see that you see that happening I, uh, right now. I mean, you if you follow the real estate market. Um, it's quite funny. Um, I was talking to Monica Hampton not that long ago with the, um, she represents economic development in Butte County. Right. And I, I was talking to her about, wow, do you, have, what's your housing situation? You know, if we're growing and people want to, you know, live in Arco, are they going to be able to find a home? And she said, you know, our connectivity is better. Um, so at least we have, you know, some better connectivity, but there's one home on the market in Arco right now. 
And, and so that's just a challenge. There might be rentals available and that's good, but, but our little rural communities are, are being discovered and especially um, by folks that can work remotely, but like to go fishing in the afternoon or take their boat down the river. Um, that's, that's a great choice for quality of life for people, for sure. You know, ARCO is so interesting because as you described, a lot of the new construction in SMRs and micros and all of that would be happening on that side of uh, the INL complex. So they've got a, if Idaho Falls thinks they have a dilemma, uh, certainly ARCO does have a dilemma in housing. Well, and it wasn't while I was here at Idaho National Laboratory, but um, but people have reminded me when there was construction of the advanced mixed waste treatment facility closer to where our museum is, our experimental breeder reactor museum, right. um, they had uh, a lot of construction workers and that, that, that took over Butte City and Arco. And um, there, there were lots of different um, different places where ARCO could benefit on this one as well. Um, but from a long term, that's really important to think about how, how do our little communities take advantage about these, these um, bursts of need that come, you know, with, with new construction workers and new needs, but how do they transform that to a longer term sustainable economy that outlasts, you know, the, the bursts of construction activities that happen? You know, one of the things that you've been deeply involved with for a number of years was the, is the Line Commission. And the Line Commission is really interesting and it was uh, created by a governor and, uh, and came into existence. So kind of describe what leadership in nuclear energy is and you know, kind of your involvement with that. What, what is this Line Commission about? <laughs> yes, the, the leadership in nuclear energy, the governor's commission, um, it was so important, I think, to our previous lab director, um, John Grossenbacher and Jeff Sayer, who was the Department mm -hmm. of Commerce director at that time and Governor Otter, to get Idaho more engaged with the great work that happens, not only with just Idaho National Laboratory, but also the other industries that surround um, and, and, and um, support and the Idaho National Laboratory. So it was um, launched many years ago now. <laughs> I don't even know. I think it may, may have been close to eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I've never been on the commission, but I have certainly been asked to lead subcommittees. And okay. one of them, you and I led, yeah. on workforce education. And that was so important because I think what's surprising is we take for granted our education community talks to each other and collaborates um, and they don't always they have to have a purpose and a need and i it when you and i started sharing this a lot of people are like yeah we don't we don't really ever talk to each other it's really good to, 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 to see you and meet you and so we really rolled up our sleeves to understand, you know, one, we needed to know what the needs were in the workforce, but two, how could we work together? Is it recruiting? Is it shared curriculum? Is it also building awareness about the careers that are out there? So all of that was a part of that dialogue and that conversation. Um, and then the, the other next step also has been on supply chain and, um, one of the efforts that Tom Keeley, Director Keeley and I were asked to kind of lead up as an effort um, is, boy, does Idaho's energy industry, you know, do we really advertise that we have this industry, you know, in energy that that um, is part of Idaho's, you know, list of different industries. And so they asked us to inventory the, uh, the energy industry right. businesses that are out there but then also really understand um, what the benefits are of our energy industry. So this was a great, um, a great exercise that we did. There are a lot of industries in Idaho and, um, that focus on energy. Um, there is also some great things Idaho can brag about. Um, 
Our neighbors to the south in Utah brag about being a green energy state. But when you look at the low to no carbon emission types of energy that Idaho generates, we stand better than our neighbors in Utah. We are really a green state and that's really important in these times. And so we put an energy industry guide together that you can find on the Commerce website. And the cool thing is also you can go to the Commerce website and there's a whole section on the energy industry now because of one of the results of some of the great work with commerce and efforts of folks at the Idaho National Laboratory. And there's a guide to the energy industry and where they can find their workforce, where they can find their businesses, um, all of that stuff that's there. It's a good, it's a, it's a good product. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah, absolutely. So here is, I, I'm, I'm kind of anxious to, to get your take on this. You, you uh, had been, uh, uh, a supporter of a community college from the very beginning. And you had to be careful, so below the radar, you, you did a lot of work, but we, we've had a number of conversations and you've helped with the community and uh, this thing came to be. So maybe two reflections. So first of all, do you feel that we're off on a good start? We're, we're approaching four years old, so kind of a new start. and. Projecting into the future, where's the puck going to go? And what do you think a two year college ought to be looking at in support of IM? Wow, that's such a fun question because, um, first of all, I am blown away with, um, with where the College of Eastern Idaho is right now. I mean, we, many of us around the table would only have dreamt that this is where you were. I mean, we, we, we penciled things out, we did projections, we looked at all of that, but we really um, were conservative and those metrics have been <laughs> blown out of the water. It, it, and I think the most important thing is, um, it's been great to see that, that, that CEI offers an affordable place to go to college and it's for everybody. I have a stepson that's enrolled right now in your nursing program and yeah. and he's a biologist, right? But and he's older and he decided that's that's where he wanted to go. He wanted to spend more time in nursing. So you you cater to a variety of different people on different schedules and that's terrific. Um we also have been blown away with also the um the amount of industry engagement that you're doing. And, and that, I, it maybe existed in the past, but you are kind, CEI is really the hub. It's the central point in which things can connect to the K through 12 programs and build out that excitement of opportunity. Right. And then you connect to industry, but you're also a pipeline and you have these great agreements with the other universities. So if people want to go on, not all will, that you're giving them a pathway from the beginning to the end and even into career where people want to change their career or do something different. And so it's 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 a beautiful um, thing that happened, I think, in terms of CPI. As far as the future, I, right. I'm really excited about future tech. I mean, yeah. the world is so integrated right now in terms of its skills and technologies at the hub of it and so you often will hire somebody that might be great at coding but you also want them to understand a large variety of other things connected to that technology and to integrate skills and be a hub of where people have to integrate those skills is so important so that what what a great amy that that is so great and, uh, we should get you to do some kind of a commercial for us <laughs> yeah. and advocacy piece because that is dead center on uh, on that and you don't have to say those kind things but but thank yeah. you you know, uh, we we worried about not having enough time, and we don't have enough time. There's a, a whole litany of other topics, but one thing I like to do as we end uh, each of these sessions is to give our guests 
an opportunity to reflect on um, uh, leadership principles. And you've, you've been a leader for a lot of years, and I'll bet you've got two, two or three principles you can share with our, with our audience. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think always continue to learn, both in your career and also in your personal life. And so I mentioned I'm a chameleon. It's it's because I have this passion to to change up, to learn, to explore. And I think that always helps at least sharing a perspective when you're trying to achieve goals in your personal life, but also in in your in your career. So I, I, for instance, took a writing class over COVID and I loved it. You know, I'm, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. it. It's been more creative writing. I do so much technical writing. Right. So I really enjoyed that. And I'm studying the salmon, right? I love the salmon species. I love to fish. So I've been doing a lot of that. So always learn. I think the other thing is just stay positive. You want to surround yourself with positive people. I like being happy. If you don't feel happy, then you need to change something. And it's really important, I think, um, to for your outcomes, to the excitement that you bring, your energy that you bring, that, that you stay positive and you surround yourself with positive things. But last, I have to share the last thing because it's so, it's so fun to say this. Um, perseverance, right? So yeah. guess what happened yesterday? <laughs> Perseverance landed on Mars and INL did such a, had such a role here to play in that technology. And that is, I love the name Perseverance because it's so important that you just you stay focused, you achieve, you, you, and maybe you change in a different direction, you chart a different course, but you, you have perseverance to continue on and to achieve your goals. So. What, a, what a great um, what a great list. But but again, that that perseverance, especially in COVID, it has been, it's been a difficult year. I hate to say we're coming up on a year, but we are. Yeah, and, yeah you're right. And, and those are the kind that, that's why you're so good uh, out with uh, our, our K-12 and uh, all the interns you get. You get a boatload of interns over the summer and um, these kind of discussions really help them and, and help pull them into the region. So, uh, so Amy, I want to thank you for uh, being my guest. And let me just uh, mention to uh, everyone that's watching that next week we'll have Jeff Newgard. And as you probably know, Jeff is the uh, president CEO of Bank of Idaho and also one of our early supporters in the community college and has done wonderful things in the area of scholarships. So Amy, thank you so much for spending some time with us. It, it well, great. thank you. And thanks for everything you do with our community and for our future generations. You and your team are fabulous. Great, thanks. Okay, thank you.